Welcome. In this video, we're going to be going over open circuit time constant estimation as well as short circuit time constant estimation. Um, open circuit time constant, time constant estimation is for estimating the high frequency poles of a system, or, or in other words, finding the um, high frequency cutoff of a circuit. Uh, short circuit time uh, constant estimation is used for estimating the low frequency cutoff of a uh, circuit. Now there's uh, many constraints that happen with this uh, estimation. We expect that the poles are all on the real axis and that the poles are fairly widely spaced apart. While this seems like it's a very strong constraint, it turns out many circuits actually do have these properties. And so it's a very uh, good method for estimating the high frequency cutoff of a circuit and the low frequency cutoff of a circuit. So let's get uh, to, the, uh, to an example and we'll see how this works. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at open circuit time constant estimation, and as well, we'll be looking at short circuit time constant estimation. So let's assume we'll start off with a system that looks something like this. So in this circuit, we have a couple of um, low frequency cutoff uh, elements. So this capacitor causes a uh, zero at DC, so it's a low frequency cutoff. This also causes a zero at DC. So these are low frequency capacitors. In addition, we have C3 and C4, which both cause zeros at infinite frequency. So they are high frequency capacitors. They cause um, high frequency cutoff. So it if you look at this circuit, you'll see that we have basically two zeros that occur at DC. And as I mentioned, this is due to C1 and C2. But we also, in this circuit, have um, two zeros at infinite frequency, and these are due to C3 and C4. We know that there are zeros at infinite frequency because at infinite frequency, they're a short circuit. And at a short circuit, um, Oh, sorry, at a short circuit, when these are short, like this and this, then the output will go to zero. So at high frequencies, the output goes to zero. Whereas these capacitors over here become an open circuit at um, low frequency, so they become an open circuit. So at low frequency, the output goes also goes to zero because we have the resistor R2 going to ground here at low frequencies. So now, because uh, C1 and C2 cause the zeros of DC, we call these low frequency capacitors. And because the C3 and C4 cause the zeros at infinite frequency, we call these high frequency capacitors. Now, if we look at this at mid band, so when we're below the high frequency cutoff and we're above the low frequency cutoff, then what we'll see is that at, um, above the low frequency cutoff, these will look like short circuits. And below the high frequency cutoff, these will look like open circuits. So basically, we have this circuit at uh, mid-band region. So at mid-band, we're driving R1 directly, so we can just ignore that. We're also driving R2 directly, so we can ignore that. So we really just have this circuit down here. So in mid-band mid region, it just looks like R3 and R4 in, in series. So we just have the V out over Vs is equal to 1. So this has a gain of uh, 0 dB at mid-band frequencies, not at DC and not at high frequencies. Now, what we want to estimate, though, is the four poles. So what we know is that because we have four capacitors in this circuit, um, there will actually be four poles. There's also no... Um, all these uh, uh, capacitor voltages are independent, so there's no cancellation, so we have actually four poles in the circuit. And we um, notice in this case we have multiple capacitors and we have multiple resistors. If we only had multiple capacitors and one resistor, it would all be a first order system. If we had multiple uh, resistors and one capacitor, it would be a first order system as well. But in this case, we have four capacitors, four resistors, and there's turns out they're all independent equations, and it's a fourth-order system. So we have four poles. 
So how do we estimate these four poles? As I mentioned, we're going to be using this open circuit time constant approach and a short circuit time constant approach. So we'll call this the OTC for the open circuit time constant and this STC for the short circuit time constant approach. As I mentioned, the short circuit one is for the low frequency cutoff and the open circuit time constant is for the high frequency cutoff. So let's start off with the short circuit time constant approach. And that's for estimating omega L, the low frequency cutoff. So what we're aiming towards is finding, we expect that we'll have some sort of transfer function that looks something like this. We're at mid-band region, we have a gain of 0 dB. But at, um, at low frequencies, we'll have a pole omega P1, and then maybe even at lower frequencies, we'll have another pole omega P2. And then at high frequencies, we'll have a pole perhaps omega P4, and then at even higher frequencies, we'll have another pole omega P3. So we're trying to find these four poles to estimate um, omega L and omega H. So the low frequency cutoff, which is given by omega L, and the high frequency cutoff, which is given by omega H. So going back to our short circuit case. So how do we find how do we do our low frequency cutoff estimation? We want to estimate the poles. So we will zero our independent source. We'll open all the high frequency caps. So in other words, we're at a frequency which is low enough that the high frequency capacity still appears open circuits. So we'll open all our high frequency caps. And then for each low frequency cap, we will find, um, for each low frequency cap, of uh, C sub i. So for each low frequency cap C sub i, we'll find the pole associated with that particular capacitor. And while we're doing that, we'll short all the other low frequency capacitors. In other words, we'll assume that it is the, uh, it is the one that acts and all the other ones have already been shorted. So in other words, it's kind of the highest frequency, low frequency pole. So we'll just make that assumption. We'll see what, uh, we'll find the pole associated with that, assuming that was true. So then when we do that, we'll find that when we're finding omega pi, we'll have the omega pi is just equal to 1 divided by r sub i divided by c sub i, where c i, remember, is the low frequency cap that we're looking at. And r sub i is the resistance seen by that capacitor, so the equivalent resistance seen by that capacitor. And once we do that, we'll find multiple omega p sub i's. In this case, we'll find two because we're looking at low frequency ones, and there's only two at low frequencies. And then omega sub L is given by the sum of all the omega P sub I. If we, um, if one of our P sub I's dominates, in other words, one of the P sub I's is much larger than all the other ones, so one may be a thousand and all the rest are like a hundred or, or 50 or so. Then if that's the case, then omega L is approximately just equal to the largest one and we can pretty much ignore all the smaller ones because they're small anyway with respect to that one. But if they're similar in size, then we want to use this uh, equation up above here. If one doesn't dominate, then we want to use this equation to omega, estimate omega L. So we sort of have two approaches here. One is to just use our equation here. And again, this is an estimate. It's not uh, exact analysis, but it's an estimate. But if one dominates, we can call that the dominant approach, then we just say that uh, omega L is equal to the largest of um, the omega sub PIs. This will become more clear as we do an example. So in the example above, where we have these values now. So we have 10 microfarads for both capacitors. We have R1 is 1K, R2 is 100K. So we also have that R3 is 1 kilo ohm, R4 is 100 kilo ohms, C3 is 1 picofarad, and C4 is 1 picofarad. So when we're doing our low frequency cutoff, and we're doing the low frequency cutoff, let's say for uh, C1, we want to find the pole associated with C1, then we will short the other low frequency capacitor, we'll open the high frequency capacitors, 
because they're both open now, and this also is not connected to anything, piece them out. So we can ignore any current that goes through here will always be zero. So that's now effectively open. What we see is that, um, look at the impedance that C1 sees is the impedance looking across here. Remember we've set this equal to zero. So it becomes a short circuit in this case. So the impedance at C1 we'll see will just be R1 in power with R2. So we'll just see the impedance looking down through here and looking down through here to ground and then coming back to over here. So it's just R1 in parallel with R2. So if we go down to this, we see that for C1, omega P1 is equal to one divided by C1 times R1 in parallel with R2. R1 happens to be much smaller than R2. So that is approximately just then one over uh, C1 times R1. And that works out to be 100 radians per second. Now if we do the same thing for C2, going back up to this circuit, now we're looking at the uh, pole associated with this low frequency capacitor. We short the other low frequency capacitor. This is shorted. These are still open as they were before, so we don't have to worry about that. And we see the impedance looking across C2. So in this case, uh, this is now shorted. So R1 is shorted, so we can ignore um, R1. Effectively, it's been shorted by this path over here. So we just have R2. So we'll see that the impedance that C2 sees is just R2 back to ground and back around. So we'll see that for C2, the pole associated with C2 is one over C2 in parallel, one over C2 times R2, which works out to be one radian per second. Now, because omega P1 is much greater than omega P2, this is 100, and this is, um, omega P1 is 100, while omega P2 is only one, we can estimate omega L is just omega P1, which is approximately 100 radians per second. So we expect that the low frequency cutoff for this circuit is around 100 radians per second. And for the high frequency estimation, which is the open circuit time constant approach, we again, we zero our independent sources as before, but now we short all our low frequency capacitors because we're assuming we're at a high enough frequency that they all look sh like shorts. Then for each high frequency capacitor, C sub i, we find the pole associated with that capacitor and when we do that, we open all the other high frequency capacitors. So in this case, we're opening them and then we find omega P sub i, which will be one over R sub i times C i, where R sub i again is the resistance seen by that capacitor C sub i. And then once we've done that, we found all of these poles, omega P sub i, which was found by this equation here, then the high frequency cutoff is approximated to be the sum of one over omega pi, and then take the inverse of that. So it's like having a parallel combination of all our omega p sub i's, as if there were resistors in parallel. So if there was two of them at the same point, let's say omega p1 was equal to uh, one mega radian per second, and omega p2 was also equal to one rad mega radians per second, then the equivalent high frequency pole would be about half of that, so 500 uh, kiloradians per second. If one dominates, so if one of the omega pi dominates, in this case it would be much smaller than all the others, then the high frequency cutoff would be the smallest of all the omega p sub i's. So going to our example that we have, we can start off with C3. So going all the way back to our circuit. And for this capacitor here, we again, we um, because we're at a very high frequency now, we're going to short C2, short C1, and we leave uh, C4 as an open circuit. And we find the impedance that we would see looking through uh, across C3. So if we added an ohmmeter, remove C3 and put an ohmmeter at that node, 
what we would see is uh, because this is an open circuit to the right of R4, we can ignore R4. We would see, um, and this has been shorted to LVS. So uh, R1 has been shorted, R2 has been shorted, so we would just see R3. So be, um, R3 would be the only, uh, would be the equivalent resistance seen across C sub 3. And if we go down to C sub 3, we see that omega P3 is indeed just 1 over C3 times R3. In this case, C3 is equal to 1 picofarad. R sub 3 is 1 kilo ohm. Multiply those two together. And we end up with 1 e to the 9 uh, radians per second. So 1 giga radians per second. We do a similar thing for C4. And what we see is when we're looking at C4 now, we'll see R3 in series with R4. Let's just go up and see that for a second. So we're looking at C4. So we're looking at the um, open circuit time constant for this. We will short these two capacitors. We will leave this one open circuited. And so we'll see this is going to ground. And from this one to get to ground, we'll have to go through here. And then that will go to ground here because this is also shorted. And we just see R3 in parallel in series with R4. So we see that for C4, it's C4 times a series combination of uh, R3 and R4 times C4. Because R4 is much larger than R3, we can approximate that as just 1 over C4 times R4, which works out to be 10 um, mega radians per second. Now in this case, since omega P4, which is 10 mega radians per second is much smaller than 1 giga radians per second. Then omega, the high frequency cutoff is approximately just equal to omega p4, or 10 mega radians per second. So if we were to plot that, we'd get a uh, graph of something like this, where we're plotting the output over the input in dB. And we see omega p1, which was the highest frequency, low frequency pole. And we have omega p4, which was the lowest high frequency pole. And so this is where omega H is due to omega P4 and omega L is due to omega P1. So this helps to give you an indication of which capacitors and which nodes are causing the um, low frequency cutoff and the high frequency cutoff and where would you spend your time if you were a designer to try to improve um, the high frequency cutoff or the low frequency cutoff, whichever one you're trying to improve. So a question that always comes up when you're dealing with open circuit time constant approaches or short circuit time constant approaches is how accurate are these estimates? So how accurate can we expect these pull estimates to be compared to actually simulating or doing the full analysis on the circuit? So that's hard to say because every circuit really um, changes and uh, the accuracy could be different. But it's useful to take a look at one example and see how accurate it would be in this one example. Remember we've said that we are assuming that the poles are fairly widely spaced um, and that they're real axis poles, which they will be in this circuit. So consider this circuit here. So in this case here, we just have a second order system and it's only high frequency. So we have no low frequency cutoff, it's just high frequency cutoffs. And that's due to C1 and C2. So we have two zeros at infinite frequency in this circuit. If you go through full analysis, you can show that V out over VI is given by this equation here. So 1 over S squared times C1, C2, R1 times R2, that's this term here, plus S times uh, C2 times R1 plus R2, plus C1 times R, and then plus 1. So that's our full analysis. Now, our, if we do our open circuit time constant approach on here, we would again say for C1, we would uh, short this, we would leave this open circuited, so we'd just see R1 in, in parallel with C1. So we'd see that tau sub 1 would just be C1 times R1. If we look at it for C2, 
So for this one, we would open circuit C1, and we'd see that the impedance across C2 seen would be R1 plus R2. Again, once this has been shorted. So if we, um, we would find that the time constant for uh, C2, which is one over the pole frequency, would be C2 times R1 plus R2. It's interesting to note that if we sum C1 R1 plus C2 times R1 plus R2, we get exactly the same value as we got here. So this term here is the sum of our open circuit time constants. And this is no approximation, this is exact. So it turns out that this is not a coincidence. The fact that um, the sum of tau 1 and tau 2 being equal to this term over here can actually be shown to be the case in general. So in other words, in the general case, if we express a transfer function as root form, so here's a transfer function where we have the root form where these are all the roots on the numerator and these are all the poles on the denominator. So our poles are omega p1, omega p2, omega pn, and so on. If you multiply those out on just the denominator, then you can show that you'll end up with a polynomial form that looks something like this. But you can also show that the uh, B1 term right here will always equal this value right here. And that turns out to be the sum of all our open circuit time constants. So it turns out that in general, um, this is the reason that the open circuit time constant is a reasonable estimate, as particularly when the poles are widely spaced, of um, what the pole locations are going to be. Now, going back to our example, if you recall, we're looking at this example here. We have R1, R2, C1, and C2. So what we'll do, it'll, for the example that we're looking at to see how accurate this is, so we'll make, we'll make C1 equal to C2 equal to 1.59 picofarads. And then we'll look at a few different cases. We'll start off with R1 equal to 1K and R2 equal to 100K. So we'll make... Um, R1 here equal to 1K and R2 equal to 100K and C1 and C2 are equal and they're equal to 1.59 picofarads. And then we'll change just uh, R1 and R2. So in the case here for R1 equal to 1K and R2 equal to 100K we can find the actual two poles because we did full analysis on this. We find that one of the poles is at 990 kilohertz, and the other pole is at 101 megahertz. If we use our open circuit time constant approach, we'll find that one of our poles, the higher frequency one, is at 100 megahertz, which is one megahertz off, it's only 1% error, whereas the other pole is estimated to be 990 kilohertz. Remember, and so the um, we would expect that the low frequency cutoff for this is around 990 kilohertz, since that's quite a bit less than 101 megahertz. So these are the low frequency cutoffs, and we can see in this case that the actual pole frequency is very close to our estimate that we had when we had a, about a 10 to 1 difference between our pole frequencies. Actually, sorry, this was 100 to 1. So we had the pole frequency is 100 times higher than our, um, uh, we had our high frequency pole, a very high frequency pole, 100 times higher than our lower frequency, high frequency pole. Now let's make them closer. And the reason they were 100, uh, 100 apart is because this was 100K and this was 1K over here. So let's make things a little closer. So now we'll make R1 equal to 10K and R2 equal to 100K. So they're only a 10 to 1 difference now. And what you find is that in this case, the actual 
uh, FP1, the actual pole of the, of the lower of the two high frequency poles is 901 kilohertz, and the other pole is at 11.1. .1. These are actual pole locations. And the estimates here, then, we have this is now 909 kilohertz, and this is 10 megahertz. So we can see that we're still fairly accurate here. In fact, we're only about uh, 8 kilohertz apart at 1 megahertz roughly for the uh, low frequency cutoff. So still fairly accurate, even though we only have a 10 times difference in, or 10 times difference in the two poles. So this is now about 10 times higher than this pole. So let's make them even smaller. So in this case, we'll make R2 still keep it at 100 kilo ohms, but make R1 equal to 30 kilo ohms. If we do that, what we find is the actual poles are at 723 kilohertz and at 4.61 megahertz. So that's about a uh, uh, six times or so difference. Um, but our open circuit time constant gives us 769 kilohertz and the uh, high frequency one is about 3.33 megahertz. So the accuracy of the higher frequency one is becoming more in error but we don't really care about that one too much. What we really care about is the um, lower frequency of the two because that's our uh, approximate cutoff. And we can see that one's still fairly accurate even though there's only about a uh, four or five difference in um, the frequency between the two poles. So you can see that this still gives us a fairly good estimate for our, uh, low for our high frequency cutoff. And so because of this reasonable estimate, even when the poles are not that widely apart, it's still a fairly reasonable estimate, you'll find that the um, open circuit time constant approach for finding the high frequency cutoff for a circuit is uh, used quite a bit, as well as a short circuit time constant approach for finding the low frequency cutoff of the circuit is used, again, quite a bit. Of course, if you just want the accurate numbers you simulate, but if you want to know what uh, circuits are dominating, what nodes are dominating in your, in your circuit, then you can use these approaches here to quickly find out what are the dominant nodes and to target those nodes when you're doing your design. Thanks for watching.